Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I wanted to start a new series, and this one has been a long time coming. Been pondering this one for, oh, you know, a few decades. But education. So this has to come with a bit of a caveat because generally I try to be as objective as possible. And with education, it's difficult because basically since I was five, so for over 40 years in my life, I've been involved in the educational system. And this gives you the advantage of having both direct experience and being inside of something, but it does sometimes make having a sort of critical distance uh, quite difficult. So that is one slight caveat there that one, you have the advantage of inside knowledge, but you have the disadvantage of not having critical dif distance that some being a bit removed in time or not being so emotionally connected to something or having so many personal experiences would allow you to, to have. So there's that slight caveat. So I'll be going through sort of education, where it is, what we're doing, what it means. And again, because personally, and for many of us, of course, most of us have gone through some form of this system, it is it is quite personal. So, and since I've been in the education system for, you know, decades and decades and decades, it will sort of have this sort of potential feel slightly autobiographical and perhaps even a bit of a confessional. So, so it will be slightly different from the other ones, but um, I think it's an important series because you hear, of, of course, a lot about education. How is it good? Is it bad? What's going on? And most of it is uh, unfocused and vague nonsense because people, for having theoretically been educated, have really done a surprisingly little reflection upon what that means. If nothing else, I've done a lot of reflection on it. <laughs> so, um, without further ado, but we're keeping those caveats in mind, let's go. Education, what does it mean? So, first thing to note is generally I like to start with a historical perspective to try and frame um, elements of the ideas that we're exploring is what we consider education, the current system of education, is in fact relatively new, um, perhaps only a little over a century old, the notion of generally, you know, more or less universal, you know, give or take, and moderately compulsory, which means you, you have to go. That concept of education has only been in effect, you know, even in the developed world for maybe a century. In the United States, sometime around 1890 or so, 1870s, it really starts picking up. I mean, it's developing over time, but, you know, somewhere around the 1890s, a good, I think, something like 60 to 70 percent of uh, young people were getting elementary school education, and then in the high school movement picks up. So sometime around 1900 in the United States and some other countries were a little earlier and other countries were later and even around the world still, this is not, you know, it's not universal, but the concept is universal. And the concept, the idea is that everyone, all, all children should receive a certain number of years of education. Um, and that education should encompass, you know, your basics of, you know, like say reading, writing and arithmetic and other subjects so that they will be prepared for something. Um, and that, that best way to deliver that is in these sort of all-day sessions of students sitting in classes with a finite number of teachers in front of them. <clears throat> that development is, A, again, shockingly new, only about a century old, maybe a little older, depending on where you, what country you are, what background you're from. And uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that this is a good way to do things. So there, by the way, this is just, there's completely, there's zero um, evidence to suggest that this is a good way to educate people. So it's, it's curious in two ways. One, it's new, uh, and so we haven't had a lot of time culturally to absorb this. And two, it's incredibly untested. It's, 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 there seems to be value there, but nobody knows what it is or how to think about it. And so that's what I want to explore in the series, this new, bizarre, cultural uh, fluorescence that has many wonderful aspects and many dubious aspects and where it all might be going and what it all might mean. But let's understand what education used to be and where it comes from. Traditionally, of course, if we go back in human society, we learned what we needed basically by mimicking the people around us. Human beings are great mimickers. Children 
will begin immediately to do what you do. This is what little kids like to do. And unless they're in some way discouraged, basically they want to do what adults are doing. This seems to be a natural human innate uh, desire and capacity for most children. And you have to sort of try and keep them from doing what you're doing to try to force them away um, if you don't want them to do that. And if you look at early uh, tribal societies and, and societies before, you know, modernization and development, basically they never did that. They always just said, yeah, you know, if you want to learn to hunt, hunt. If you want to learn to fish, you fish. If you want to learn to dig roots, you dig roots. You know, it was this process of everybody sort of participating to the level of their capacities and they're learning fast. In fact, there's one thing people note whenever they encounter these societies is like, man, the kids are really, really capable at an incredibly early age, which seems to us an incredibly early age, but it's because they've been participating actively you know, their whole lives, and so they're picking these things up. And for some reason, we think this is sort of, well, yeah, that's how people used to do it, but this isn't really education for some way, or they're not learning that much, of course. This is entirely absurd. If you want to talk about learning, try and go make a go of it in a rainforest someplace or on a uh, on a plane where you're trying to hunt and dig roots through various seasons and against animals and under all kinds of adverse weather conditions. These people have a spectacular amount of firsthand knowledge of birds, weather, uh, food, seasons, you know, medicine, everything. I mean, they're walking encyclopedias of their society, culture, and skills. Otherwise, they die. It's a really, it's a really excellent education system in the sense of failure simply means death. And so, uh, you know, you, you know how you're doing at any given time because if you're alive and thriving, hey, you're doing great. Ah, if you're starving to death, something is not going well. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of an exaggeration, but basically this is it. And so humanity has survived for a long, long time because ba we're, we're incredibly good mimics. Also, they get language. They get stories, they learn music, they have an incredible amount of skills, the art, they make clothing. I mean, they, again, the, the, the range of capacities that these people learn over their lifetime without ever sitting in a classroom is extraordinary. And again, it's always moderately shocking to us because we associate education with this system of the classroom, which is, of course, really, really quite new historically. So if you fast forward a little bit, suddenly as, as societies grow, as you begin to get cities, you begin to get specializations. And mostly what specialization involved then is some sort of arrangement. Uh, sometimes it was just simply f by family, but sometimes it was a formalized contractual arrangement, even if it was just a verbal contract, where someone would work as an apprentice or an intern. So you go, oh, the guy that's down the road that's my buddy, he's a metal worker, and I've always worked in leather. I've got three sons. He's got no kids, so I only need about two in the leather working shop. So that third kid who doesn't look too bright, I'll ship him off to my buddy, and he'll live over there, and he'll learn metal working. And what's important here is generally, not invariably, of course, because it's usually a complex number of societies, but generally this was a living arrangement. You would agree to live and work with somebody for a set number of years, and then you would be considered, you know, capable of going out on your own and pursuing that field. So again, it's the same model. How do you learn metalworking? Well, you live with a guy who does metalworking and you get up in the morning and you work on this on, you know, just about every aspect of it. And then at the end of the day, you go to sleep exhausted. And after a couple of years, you're probably going to know how to learn metalworking unless you're completely inept at this sort of skill and you run off and pursue some other trade. But these are how the trades were uh, passed along. So in a world where almost everyone is farmers and peasants, you learn farming that way, of course. And if you're in a city and you have a trade, you learn the trade through mimicry. So this was, you know, precisely the same. There's no differentiation between the process of creating the knowledge or, or gaining the knowledge that you need to, to pursue your life. Um, the slight distinction begins or evolves uh, when you start getting scribes. And uh, scribes are a very interesting evolution because most of the early writing that we have is associated with bookkeeping. 
So literacy and bureaucracy sort of <laughs> coterminous. When you, it seems that the, the bureaucrats created the literacy so that they could create more paperwork. So if you've ever had this suspicion that language, written language is mostly about paperwork, it may be true. It really might have been evolved in its primary function to fill the needs of bureaucracy and bookkeeping and record keeping because once societies achieved a certain scale, you have these problems of, you know, large grain storage, uh, shipment records, uh, donations to temples. You had to keep track of those, which was also sort of an early form of banking. You know, it, it's complex. It gets complex actually fairly quickly. You need to keep track, you know, you need to communicate with the people in the neighboring provinces. If you're a, a big potentate king and you have lots of sub-potentates that run, you know, distant provinces, you have to communicate with them and we need to know what they're doing and they have to report back and, hey, presto, pretty soon you have a bureaucracy. And if you have a bureaucracy, to have a bureaucracy and have a functioning bureaucracy, you need people who are literate. One of the Chinese kings overthrew, uh, he was a he, uh, emperor, he, he overthrew, he was not an uneducated man, and, and he raised a rebellion, and he overthrew the, the sitting emperor, and when the, uh, basically, not the full sort of um, hierarchical clerks that we would think of later that you get from the full exam system, but something on towards that direction. They were starting to move towards being, you know, high-end scribes. Came to him, uh, he knocked one of their hats off, which was the symbol of an educated man, a member of the imperial bureaucracy, and he pissed in it. And so he filled it with urine and said, ha, I've conquered, you know, I've conquered this empire on horseback. And they were like, hey, that's great, good for you but you're not going to be able to rule it on horseback. You're going to have to have scholars that you just have to. You, you, it's, it's necessary. And no scholars can't run the emperor, empire. And so that concept is, is very powerful and correct. So what happens is you get this sort of uh, educated elite, as it were, who are literate. And so for, for if you think back to you know ancient Egypt, so, I mean, we're going back thousands of years, ancient China, uh, Babylon. I mean, so I don't know, how do you pick a date on this? Let's just go, let's say starting around 3000 BC, random date. Um, you really do start to see this fluorescence all over the world, India, um, of this literate scribal elite who make things run. And they have a very specialized education, which is to say literacy, and that education is focused on making literacy difficult. So this is the, one of the keys of it. These ancient languages were often very, very refined because it was the instrument of an elite whose goal was to keep other people from being able to get at it. So, um, you know, trying to, to, to decipher Mayan script took a long, long time because it's really much more complicated than you would think would be necessary and exactly right. Hieroglyphics, in fact, there are more than one kind of hieroglyphics, but hieroglyphics have this, you know, challenging, very challenging, but this is partly the point. The point is to make it uh, difficult for people to get in because this maintains your authority and power. And so they set up very small schools, usually associated with families again. So most of this, again, is learned in the household. So the children, generally male children of scribes, would learn from their, their parents. And then this would be generational. But if your kingdom is expanding and you can't do that fast enough, small schools would be set up. Uh, this was done in the uh, tradition, Old Testament Hebrew tradition, you had uh, in, in all over, basically in every ancient society, they started setting up very small schools. But what's important to note here is these were not like general education. They tended, A, to be associated with religion because these are tended, scribal traditions tend to be heavily religiously associated, although the Confucian tradition is, is an accepting of an exception to that. Um, and so it, there was generally not a clear dividing line of where um, you know, the, the, this is a school for literacy and this is a school for becoming a priest, right? That's sort of often vague. Uh, again, you, you see this all the way with 
Hebrew, the Jewish tradition, the, the, the link between education and religion maintains itself until pretty much today, actually, one could argue, but certainly until very recently. Um, and so that force meant that a very tiny, now again, we're talking, you know, sub 1% of the population, maybe a little more, uh, is gaining a specialized literacy that is used for very specific purposes. But for 99% of the population, it says no bearing. This just does not exist. I mean, <clears throat> they're going about their day. They don't read. They don't write. They learn through um, apprenticeships, mimicry, experimentation, doing what the family has always done, or setting out on your own and doing something new, but you learn it through doing it, this very direct. And, and what's shocking is that's what drove civilization for the next, oh, you know, whatever, 4,900 years, right? <laughs> that was the system of education that almost everybody participated in that provided almost all of the innovations, developments, uh, great moments of history that we're associated with. They were often written down, of course, by literate people, but often they were not the prime actors. Now, now sometimes kings and generals and such might themselves be literate. Hello, Caesar. Uh, hello, Marcus Aurelius. But uh, that literacy was a mark of their distinction, not really. It was, it, I mean, they needed it to function, but they didn't. That's not what was where they came from, right? Their their power came from someplace else, and and they were educated not in schools again. They were educated at home, and so what happens is, if you weren't going to become a priestly servant of something or or something like the Confucius class then the elites had their own education system, which was almost always tutors. So you would be educated in your home by a tutor. Again, this is very different. We don't have, we still don't have schools. So you get great writing, great poetry, great literature, incredible innovations and insights. Um, and where do they come from? They come from scribal traditions and they come from tutors. They don't come from schools because they don't exist yet. They're certainly not universal compulsory education. That's sort of, nobody thought that was a good idea for, you know, we're still a few thousand years until that's a good idea. Um, and so th what we think of as necessary really historically was not. Um, he, by the way, even Benjamin Franklin, you know, he was apprenticed as a uh, typesetter, typesetter, right? So this is how recent it is. Jefferson and Washington are educated by tutors primarily. Um, not, not in schools. They, you know, they just didn't attend them, generally speaking. So because they didn't exist per particularly uh, as something that was generally available. So, you know, it's very recent that our system exists, and it's important to keep that in mind. So as time goes on, several things develop uh, simultaneously that lead to the notion that we need a broader swath of society to have access to education. And primarily that is simply the demands of an increasingly complicated and increasingly tight knit world. As trade develops, as road networks develop, as sailing develops, all of a sudden the world becomes slightly smaller. This is the, this is the important thing of travel time. When, when if you can travel someplace more quickly and more easily, what you're essentially doing is making the world uh, shrink. And so you're encountering new ideas, new people, different languages, different concepts, and all of a sudden, you know, the demand slowly increases and goes, oh, you know, we need scholars who can translate from not just the neighboring people whose language is probably fairly close to ours, or even if it's different where there's people, you know, we had a war a couple of years ago and we captured some slaves and they taught us that language, right? So, we, but if we're going three mountain ranges over across a big river and then across another mountain range. Well, those people speak some crazy ass language that nobody knows how to speak that. So we're going to have to have a, a person who, who, who figures this out and a couple of people maybe who figure this out. So one of the earliest forms of scholarship that you start encountering is linguistic scholarship of simply the need to communicate with people who are using languages that are quite different. Then you have merchants who are trying to figure out, you know, 
what is the cost of things? How do, what are the trading rates? What is the value? What, you know, all of this sort of record keeping, bookkeeping, monetary tracking issues develop both mathematics, of course, drives this bookkeeping issues and, uh, and record keeping, you know, trying to keep your partners from ripping you off, always a tricky thing throughout history. You know, these sorts of transactions have to be tracked, how much is in the warehouse, what's coming in, what's going out. And so you slowly get this increasing demand for scribes, for scholars, for people who can, you know, basically do this, who can keep track of it. But it takes a very long time before that demand grows into any sort of formalized education system. You know, you start getting the quadrivium and the trivium and the quadri quadrivium, um, you know, Again, when do things start? I don't. I mean, how, what do you call it? Generalized, but I, you know, I think it's something around the 14th or 15th century that even five percent of the population might be begin receiving a formal education um, in Europe. In um, China, the the Confucius uh, exam system, which was one of the models for how do you create a, a, a modern elite educated, you know, bureaucracy, you know, we're talking vanishingly small. A, you had to be able to, your family had to be able to afford to hire tutors for you to take the exams. Then you had to have the free time to study to take the exams. And then you had to pass the exams, which were incredibly rigorous and difficult. So, you know, we're talking a, a minuscule percentage. And then what that created was another percentage of the people who failed to pass the exams who sort of worked as secretaries and on-call job people. So you sort of created this sort of literary uh, never world of, of these scholars who didn't quite make the cut to become bureaucrats, but who could fulfill all these roles for merchants. And they worked for the Confucius scholars who did pass the imperial exam system because there were never enough of them, so they had to hire other people. And so you kind of became low-level bureaucrats uh, without job title, you know. So there's very interesting. A lot of the writing that comes out of China comes actually from these people because the actual Confucius people who passed the exam were too busy, right? They had stuff to do. They didn't have a lot of time to um, mess around. So they didn't, they didn't, much of the writing, again, comes from these people who actually studied but didn't quite make it. They were sort of the more productive of the literature and, and observations. But again, we're still talking this microscopic percentage of the population. But the world is expanding, it's growing more complicated, and the demand grows and grows. And then finally, you begin to get institutions that form, like the colleges in Paris or Sevilla, or the military starts getting things like engineering schools, because like cannons, right? You get cannons, and all of a sudden you're like, ooh, we need people who can fire cannons. Ah, that involves sort of at least some low level math um, and then you want fortifications and that takes some higher level math and you know and per, you know pretty soon you're like okay so we need engineering schools the military wants engineering schools we want to have staff colleges with well, churches you know you think of the catholic church trying to manage you know millions of acres and all that money and all of the doctrine doctrinal disputes and it's like okay well we got to have a lot of secretaries and you know, same problem in Imperial China. They've got to send stuff all over the place. You have the Golden Age of Islam rolls in here, and they have the same problems, except they tend to be very decentralized. So you have all these courts, and they're trying to communicate with all these other courts and separately. But this, these impulses of the expansion and, and growing complexity of, of the world all lead to the same notion, which is, hey, we need to have a more formalized system of educating people and that meant that we get young people, almost exclusively men at this point, and we sit them down and we train them something. Now, this is where the wheels fall off as far as uh, education goes, because what are you supposed to be training them? Now, no one has ever answered this question with any sort of great capacity. This is the this is what is so vexing and that we'll be dealing with for much of the rest of this series on education. 
So if you are in, say, the Islamic world, Islamic golden age, of course, anytime you're in the in most educated people there, the, re the religion is your primary goal. Just like in the imperial exam system in China, the Confucius doctrines and, and the, the, the big noble books, those are the primary core of your education. It didn't matter what you were going to study. It didn't matter if we were going to put you in part of a canal, you were going to be a general in the army, you were going to be, if you were going to be an educated person, step one, Quran. Step one, the Confucian classics. Step one, um, in Europe, you would think it would be the Bible, but it actually turned out to be the Latin classics, classics from, you know, um, from Rome, bizarrely. Well, that's a whole nother series of lectures. But, you know, so they, but that's what you had to do, the trivium, right? We have to learn the Latin language, the Latin rhetoric, uh, all this, all this stuff from Latin. And it's like, oh my goodness. Okay. So Latin becomes the language of the educated elite in Europe. Um, of course, Arabic and the Quran and the poetry associated with that becomes the educated language for the, you know, the whole, uh, the is Islam of the house of Islam. And in China, and we'll just use these three examples, it's other places in the world as well. Of course, it becomes the Confucian classics. <clears throat> and so this education system is not necessarily about learning what you need to know to do some particular job. It's about becoming a member of an elite and and acquiring a worldview that you share because you all have this incredibly well-known common vocabulary, experience, and outlook. That was the goal. How effective it was, you know, history is very variable on that. But that was the idea. We're going to have a sh shared set of texts. All the people who are going to consider themselves educated are going to know them, basically have them memorized. We will test them on that so that we can make sure they're the right kind of people. And so originally, one of the ideas was if you get the right kind of people, it doesn't matter what job you give them. In fact, this is still a common idea. Uh, if, if you've got a good person and they know the, the right things about morals and worldview, then if they're an accountant or a doctor or a mayor or a prince, it doesn't matter because they're they're good people and you put good people in charge of things and it goes well bad people in charge of things it goes poorly and so that early model of education which is why it's we always find this sort of baffling or, or people who, who sometimes discover this are like hey you know why is it that knowing the Confucian classics makes you you know, experienced enough to be put in charge of a canal system whose the engineering of which is just unimaginably complex and on which the feeding of millions and millions of people depend. And it turns out that, yeah, you wouldn't think that would work, but it turns out it does work. It works well enough to keep, you know, Chinese civilization operable for a few thousand years. So, you know, and that, but, but so we still don't really have the notion of specific technical education because this is still very much associated with the trades and with apprenticeships, but which is, of course, still what the vast majority of people are getting. But slowly, slowly, the demand for increasingly number of, increasing numbers of literate people and people who have the right outlook grows so that you go, oh, okay, we need more and more of these, so more schools begin to be set up. And again, you get the... Universities are so Oxford and Cambridge, famously. You get Sevilla, Paris, <clears throat> all over Europe. This starts to grow. But again, these institutions tend to still be heavily associated with religion and very loosely bound with like law was a possibility and medicine. Although you can see why these things just, they fit sort of, but not that well. But this is what starts happening. And slowly, the classroom becomes the model. Now, there are certain things you can learn in the classroom, but as a model, it's only certain things, right? What you're going to do is sit down with a book or with, with paper. Again, paper, very expensive, by the way, for most of history. So that was also something that kept people from playing the, the literacy game, you know, and learn to write and learn to read and, you know, do lots of rote memorization and recite this back to the teacher. And so we're off and running. But there's all these tensions that are there, and it's all the tensions that develop over the next couple of hundred years, 
that lead us to where we are today and that many of the problems that people feel education have are are in part because it's evolved out of several different strands uh, none of which are, are which are not necessarily mutually exclusive but they're not necessarily mutually comp complementary either so you have on one hand an elite system that says literacy particularly a specific kind of weird kind of literacy is what we want to inculcate in people because we're mostly interested in a moral or philosophical perspective. And if you have that, then we say you're good and we'll just find something for you to do that fills your interests and or your capacities. On the other hand, you have the increasing amount of technical education, as I mentioned, like the military training and the engineering, the metallurgy, all of this comes rolling in. Where it's like, oh, you want to build a large sailing ship. Now, this is a thing now. Okay, well, we're getting better. But, well, when 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 do we start having ships engineering? Naval engineering becomes a subject. And you can study naval engineering. Originally, though, this was like a trade school. And so trade schools also begin to develop. So that larger schools that train larger numbers of students for specific undertakings. Because you can no longer fulfill all the demand just from apprenticeships they don't you know if your navy like say the british navy all of a sudden is going to expand or the chinese navy is going to expand massively as it did for a while and then it didn't um you know you, you've got to have a lot of people how do you get a lot of people that you can ramp up production so quickly well you've got to train them and so they start setting up sort of airsoft schools which become sometimes formalized schools and then you go ooh. Well, if, if I want to be a lawyer, do I go to a university? In some countries, yes. In other countries, no. It's a, it's a separate thing. Even today, law is not part of the most universities' departments of humanities, right? If, you get a, if you're a doctorate of philosophy, <clears throat> that covers like all. Oh, everybody gets a PhD, doctor of philosophy, because <clears throat> almost all the humanities are covered in that, like chemistry and mathematics and all this. But law is not. Law is, is, is a different uh, doctorate, J.D., because a uh, doctorate of jurisprudence, because it's from a different tradition. And medicine, right? So you, as an undergraduate, you'll go pre-med, which means you take a bunch of the classes that other people might take as an undergraduate, but then you transfer into a different program because medicine also isn't under that old rubric. And so you see, even today, we have these uh, vestigial you know, hangovers of, of how do you, what's a trade, what actually is tra tra trained at a university, what's the sort of scribal elite is supposed to be doing, um, and, and how does this all roll out? Again, important to note, however, that until, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, this was all a game of the elite. But sometime around the turn of the century, in the United States famously used the Prussian education model, but there's various ones, the press came on to say, hey, Everybody, every child, first every male child, but then eventually like every child should in theory have the opportunity to receive an education. Why? Ah, here's the big thing. There are all kinds of different arguments about why, and then the different arguments about why lead to different concepts of what education is for. And it's important to just think of a few of these. One is the trade model. So young people should receive an education so that they will be fit for employment. This is one idea. This is a common idea. We don't really believe it, but it is a common idea. And we certainly don't have an education system designed on it, but people still think this way, and we'll see a lot of this. And you can see this comes from, basically, that's the oldest tradition that you're learning your livelihood. You're learning how to hunt because we're a hunting gathering society. You're learning how to fish because we are a fishing society. You're learning how to farm because we're a farming society. And that just makes sense. And so you extrapolate that over several thousand years of the development of civilization. And so, hey, I want to do something and learn to do something. So I should participate in doing that. And that's what my education is for. Then you have this notion of the civic education, which people like, even though it has a sort of moderately sinister origin and one can still see the problems with it, which we struggle with mightily. 
the notion that, hey, as we move into more enlightened times, and this is a, a, partly a product of the Enlightenment, the notion of people should be able to participate in the framing of their society and in their own governance. Yay, democracy. This is wonderful. But to do that, uh, you need to have a citizenry that is capable of understanding what's going on, to be able to read things, for instance, and, and know what the issues are, to ponder them, and to come up with solutions that might may or may not be viable. And so this is the notion of civic education. That's to say the purpose of education is not to get people jobs. People will get jobs anyway. The purpose of an education is to give people the necessary grounding and outlook that will allow them to be effective citizens. And in a democracy, this means effectively sort of, in theory, of course, a participant in the governing of themselves and their country. And that is sort of an extrapolation of the elite Confucius idea, which is if we're going to manage a place, if we're going to uh, be able to run a country, then we need a shared outlook that allows us to ponder our problems and come to some sort of consensus about how we should address them and do this. So we make good people, and if you have a country of good people, then they'll make good decisions and everything will be great. This is a civics education. Um, of course, <laughs> this is often hard to distinguish between just pure indoctrination. And as I mentioned, we got it from the, the Prussian education system. And one of the impulses for this was if you're a king, um, we often get confused historically because of uh, we don't have an aristocracy in the United States, historically speaking. And so we, we lose track of this. But the aristocracy and kings and emperors are generally at war with each other. They're, they're you know, not necessarily violent war, but sort of cultural war. Their powers, the aristocracy wants to take power from the king because they're sort of oligarchs. They want to share power amongst themselves. The king, of course, wants to aggregate power to himself or herself, the queen, so that uh, they don't have to kowtow or negotiate with the aristocracy. No one cares about the peasants. They're for walking upon. So, what the king, what the Prussian uh, king worked out was like, hey, what I need is a group of educated people who I can rely on. I don't want to get them from the church because, you know, hey, we had the Reformation, all kinds of trouble there. And I don't want to rely on the princes and the sort of lesser nobles who have generally supplied a lot of the educated people to become ambassadors and generals and all this because they're the aristocracy. Every time I give a job to an aristocrat, I'm partially sort of trying to buy them off and make them work for me, but I'm also sort of giving money and power to the people I'm trying to cut out. So what I need is an independent group of people who think the right way and who will work for me the right way. And so the Prussian education system was a way of kind of organizing lots of young men to make them available for Prussian service who would have the right outlook. And the right outlook is that the Prussian king is great, the Prussian state is awesome, eh, aristocrats, we're not so interested in them, and here we go. And so that is the, the sort of the downside of the civic education is you can see how it can rapidly turn into brainwashing nationalism. And so lots of systems, hello Soviet Union, who had very aggressively pursued uh, modern education models, their goal was a, quote, an educated populace, but mostly what they wanted was a servile populace who had the right outlook. This is always, you know, this is one of the goals. You want the people to think the right way. How do we get them to think the right way? Well, let's indoctrinate them. And this is, again, I mentioned in another lecture long ago, um, but this is actually what education means. Educare is to sort of draw out what's in. Inducare, indoctrinate, means to put in from what's outside. And so in theory, one way to read the word uh, education from its roots is to say is, is is to develop that which is inside of a person, but often what it really is is like, no, let's take stuff from outside and put it in them. So there's also this tension. Are we trying to stuff people, some stuff content into people, or are we trying to draw what's great out of them? And that is, so we have the sort of the civics, let's make people good people, often an indoctrination system, but not invariably. And then you have the trade system, which is like, hey, what we're really trying to do is get people to have skills that we need to make our society function, and they want jobs, so that works. And then you have the aristocratic system, uh, 
which again is a very different goal uh, because what an aristocrat has position and has money and has power probably wants more of all these, but they have them to a certain extent or else you wouldn't be an aristocrat. That's what it means to be an aristocrat. And so your notion of education is I want to make myself great. I want to be more fabulous. How do I make myself more fabulous? And so what's enticing, I think, often what speaks to us about the prince of the writing of the ancient Greeks or uh, many of the uh, sages of the ancient world from wherever they're from is they are elites speaking to other elites. And when they talk about education, it's, they're, it's completely different because what they're saying is, I want to be the best possible version of myself I can be. How do I do that? I'm already awesome. How do I become even more awesomer, right? This is my goal. Uh, I often think of Renaissance education as, as what can I do to be more fabulous today than I was yesterday? It's like, let's be fabulous. I love this idea of, of Renaissance education because they tended to be notable people. And so they wanted to be more notable. They wanted to be more fabulous. And that's a great goal. But it's a different goal from getting a job. And it's a different goal from being a good citizen. They didn't, they were not interested in being good citizens by, I mean, they might be okay by the way, but they're more interested in being really great, powerful versions of themselves. Often this made them bad citizens because they tried to overthrow governments and do this kind of thing, particularly the ancient Greeks. And so <clears throat> we have at least three, and then you have, I'm sorry, and then you have the fourth and three and then four, don't let's forget the fourth, is you had this incredibly strong tradition from religion. Because the scribal tradition often, not invariably, but often associated with religion. And so this whole series of uh, religious associations with education carry right through to today and sometimes gets absorbed into the civic thing. Like, oh, teaching good morals means teaching a particular religious worldview, which means that good citizens have to have good religion. And so that is what school is about. But there's also this notion of that what education is for is helping you become a better person within the context of your religion. And so those four, there's maybe a few more, but I think let's, let's stick with those to keep in mind. Um, have all come from different aspects of the evolution of education over the last several thousand years. The, the trade or apprenticeship program is the clearest and simplest to understand. Um, but seems most vexing in the modern world, but probably the, it's the oldest simple one of just mimicry. Then you have the, uh, the civic notion of let's indoctrinate a group of people, whether small Confucius scholars or large everybody in a country, compulsory general education, with a shared worldview so we can all get along and be good citizens and participate. Um, then you have the religious tradition which is to say that the best thing that you can do with an education, um, this is, you know, madrasas and the J Jewish tradition is get closer and closer and, and more knowledge of God because all good things are going to come from that. And then finally, you have the elite system of education, which is to say we're powerful and important people <clears throat> make us greater. Like, how do I become a greater version of me? I want to increase my personal excellence. I don't need a job. I have a job. People, lowly servanty people have jobs. I'm, I'm rich and wealthy. So what is education to me? And I don't want to be a good citizen because screw that. I want to run the place. I don't want to be, I don't want to get along with other people unless it makes me, unless I want to, but I may not want to. So, so forget that. I'm certainly not interested in religion because I worship me. So, you know, that sort of tradition is very different, <clears throat> but notice how influential it's been. So you can look at schools like Oxford and Cambridge in England, you know, famous schools. Tr originally, they were heavily, 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 well, they were religious institutions. You know, Newton, I always think, you know, Newton had to give periodic uh, sermons, which, which he apparently regularly missed. I, can't, I, I, I read it a long time ago, but he, he only gave like three or something in the whole time he was there is it you know and he was supposed to give one you know, once a month or something so he missed what 150 or 200 but theoretically he was there to be a priest that was that was his job and you see this in vestigial sort of uh religious connotations to education all over the place 
Um, it took a long time for the sciences to make it, and they were apprentices now. You know, to be a scientist was to be an apprentice. And even today, the scientific tradition is you work in someone's lab, and they hand the lab down, right? Like, okay, if you want to learn how to do something in science, you go to where they're doing it, you work with those people, and they sort of say, oh, after a couple of years, yes, you know how to do this now, and then you'll go someplace else, and you'll train people up. I mean, the, the, the structure of many of the science, uh, scientific education, particularly at an advanced level, is essentially still that of the apprenticeship. Because, you know, how else do you run, learn to run a nuclear accelerator? You know, you go to some place where they have one and you mess around with it. And you're like, oh, look, now I know how to run this. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then eventually they go, hey, do you want to be in charge? Because and you go, okay, and then what, what's my main job? Your main job is to train the other people, right? The, the people who are coming up below you to run this thing, to do the research and to run the experiment. So, you know, that is not really <clears throat> gone away. And so these four sort of parallel, these four traditions that evolved in parallel, crossing over each other, mutually reinforcing at times, contradictory at times, lots of conflict in different places at times, led to, again, around, you know, depending where you are, about 100 years ago, maybe a little more some places, less other places, this notion that, hey, let's educate everybody um, and let's do it so that it's mandatory. And that's the, the last one I want to get to is why mandatory? And again, nobody is quite clear um, what we mean by why mandatory. The, the notion is has come from several different places. And it's like general. Why do we want a general? Well, if you think education is necessary for people to participate successfully in the economy and you want a strong economy, then you want an educated populace. You'll hear this all the time. Um, it's, it's, it's nonsense, by the way, but that's okay. We'll just go with that because it's very vague, and we'll talk about that in future ones, why this doesn't seem clearly as, as functional as it sounds like on first hearing. Um, but, yeah, so some people say that's why you want people to be educated. Other people say, no, 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 it's so that everybody has equality. We want an equal chance, right? It's, it's, in, it's in a society that doesn't have uh, strong aristocratic or hierarchical tendencies, what you need is for everyone to have the opportunity to pursue an education. And that's very egalitarian and, and, and great uh, ethics in, in theory, in practice, of course, we'll struggle with that. But notice that's a very different argument from saying that, oh, we want egalitarianism, we want everyone to be able to participate, is different from saying, hey, we want you to get a, a really good job so you can make money and support the economy. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but you can see the tension there. And then, of course, there's the civic argument to say, look, if if we're going to have a democracy, then everybody who participates in a democracy needs to have a sufficient level of education to, to make a go of it, as I just mentioned earlier. Um, so, yeah, we have to do that. But again, notice this is different from saying egalitarianism, which is to say flatten the society, give everybody opportunity, versus uh, civics, you just need to know enough to be able to read a ballot and then, and then you can vote and then, then your job is done and go away. And monetary, which is to say you, voting and making money have no strong correlation. And so how you educate around, educate around that is very different. Then you have the child welfare argument, which is to say that essentially it would be unfair. You would create a hugely it's sort of related to the egalitarian argument, but it's kind of from the other side. And you see both of these, which is to say if um, some children would simply be left out, it would almost be a form of child abuse for its children not to be allowed to participate in the educational system. And because parents are untrustworthy, because they might not want their kids to participate for whatever reason, then we have to force them to allow their children to participate. And part of this was an economic problem when you had large areas of uh, rural areas where children were working on farms. It's like a sort of an anti-child labor approach to education to say, if we force parents to let their kids, because of course, you know, the kids, it's not the kids, it's the parents you're, you're, you're putting the compulsion on. Um, if you're forcing the parents to put their kids in school, this means that parents can't put their kids into factories or into work on the farm or wherever else they were going to have them do. 
uh, whatever work they're going to have them do for financial gain or just to support the family, by the way. A lot of times parents weren't making up the economic need. <clears throat> and so for to protect child welfare and to keep them out of factories and can keep them being exploited in various ways, we want to put them in schools. This is a protective notion of sort of education as protector of the weak and downtrodden, which is to say the children. This is the state basically is understood to be a better uh, provider of care than our parents and or the community or that the small community, the familial community uh, understood large, more largely the village community, perhaps than the, uh, than the state is better than those people. And of course, these are all mixed together and get jumbled up and come out in all kinds of ways. But, but that all of these forces came together in different countries to different varying degrees to come up with this notion of, let's, hey, let's have universal compulsory education. And, and that is weird because, again, it's new. And so what we mean by education, whew, uh, at least four major strands, as I've mentioned, and then the goal of making it compulsory and universal also comes from different impetuses and different uh, political and social and ideological ideas, which creates all these sort of fissures and weird tensions. And then finally, just to make it even more complicated, is so let's say we've all decided it's a great idea that say that all the kids should get educated, whatever that means, right? We're not sure who cares what that means. The question is then what's the best way to do that? Well, damn. So it turns out that this coincided, this notion of universal education of children coincided in, in the West. And then that was sort of exported all over the world with the development of the factory system. And so it seems that it was just in the zeitgeist, as it were. I mean, that's sort of a historical cheat, I guess. But it really is seems to be it, that it just seemed like, oh, clearly the best way to do this is to mimic a factory. And so schools became mimicked on and still are mimicked on factories. And what this means is you have to have a model of the student as, you know, clock, Right? It's something that's being made in a factory. It goes in at one end, a certain amount of time and labor is put into it, and it comes out at the other end. And this vision of the child as participant as a unit within a factory, and if you look at the early educational literature, it is all about this. And if you think about how much emphasis is put on time in school and number of classes and all these metrics, they're all factory metrics. They have nothing to do with education or with children. Children, of course, don't belong in factories at all. And we go with, theoretically, we're taking kids out of factories. That's why we put them in schools. But we really did is put them in a different factory, a better one probably because they weren't like getting their heads crushed in steam presses. This is a big plus. However, a factory nonetheless. Um, and, and that model is an export around the world because this seems to be the idea. And so what happened is organic process happened with the historical development of, of cultures all over the world uh, as modernism takes hold and as the factory system takes hold, these different intellectual traditions around education come together in the notion of compulsory universal education at the time that the factory system is rolling. And so, hey, presto, by 1910, 1920, 1930, certainly post-war, much of the world all kinds of different cultures all over the world have adopted essentially the same outward look of what education is. It's young kids going in when they're quite young, five, if elementary school or, or kindergarten in the United States begins at five, shockingly young. They spend lots of time in classrooms with one teacher there usually sitting at desks or sitting at tables or sitting on the ground, it really doesn't matter, facing forward. Um, and then 12 years later, or 12, uh, let's see, yeah, how many years later? A lot, yeah, 12 years later, if they're lucky, they come out the other side and they get some sort of diploma that says you're a very good person because you've done all this. 
And perhaps then they go on to college, in which case they have another four years. Then perhaps they go on to graduate school, in which case they have another God only knows how many years. And then at the end of this, they are an educated person. But at any point, theoretically, you can claim to be educated. And that model is now universal. So this is the background and development that underwrites our current system. And as I said, at no point, never uh, in any of this, did anybody stop and say, well, people have stopped and said, has it never been adopted a system where they said, hey, what ways do children learn best? Um, what is it we're trying to teach them? How would be an efficient way for children to learn this? What are the goals of our education system? You would think we would know all that. You would think that would be the obvious thing. But as I mentioned, because this developed organically and because it actually mixes so many different elements together, it really becomes difficult and, in fact, in, in this case, perhaps impossible to articulate clearly what it is we're trying to do. Therefore, there's no clear model of how to do it. And so as we move forward, I want you to keep this in mind because it's very easy, and I'll do a fair bit of criticism. People love to criticize the education system. But to forget, it's easy to forget that it, there, the system part, it just doesn't exist. There never was. I mean, this notion that, oh, there's some rational capacity, that there was a model that was studied and put into place, and this showed that the outcomes would be the best, and this is how people learn. Like Zero. I mean, really shockingly little of this actually exists in education, and certainly it has no impact on edu how education is provided how these systems are set up they're set up under an incredible array of other forces and interests which we'll talk about um, none of which have to do with what's the best way to educate people because if you look at that which we will discuss we'll look at the evidence and research system on that it's yeah it's not what we have what we have came from a factory model <clears throat> that I, like I said, I, you know, only explanation I have is that it was in the zeitgeist and it came from these other forces often concerned with child welfare and with uh, civic equality. These are not negative goals. These are positive goals. And then what followed was structural developments that, um, that created the model that we're all familiar with, but it's not based on research or outcomes or how children learn or what's the best way to produce people who get jobs and how to grow your economy. None of this is, is, is in there. They're zero. The correlation is essentially zero. And we'll explore and talk about all that. So episode one of probably God only knows how many. I'll, I'll, I'll stop droning on at some point, uh, but it's going to take a while. So, so hang on uh, for this uh, very intimate, perhaps slightly biographical or autobiographical, I guess, because it's my, my story, um, as we move through the education system. And next time, uh, the subject will be administration. So that'll be great. Thank you very much.